been facilitating um, processes, be it you know workshops or planning processes or whatever it might be, meetings, things like that for decades. And one of the things that I've learned is you forget to frame what it is you're doing at your peril. So framing this, this workshop and what we're going to get out of it is really important, but also framing the work of impact measurement is incredibly important. And if you just dive into picking a tool or picking a platform, things like that, um, you're really going to miss what's important. So the reason that we do this work is to increase our impact and the way that we get there is cyclical. So this is supposed to be um, circle-ish, this slide. Um, so you start with a strong theory of change, which is just a guess, really. It's, a, it's an educated guess or a hypothesis as to how what it is that you do creates impact. So when you're first articulating that, you may not know if this is correct, but based on everything you do know, it's your best guess as to what happens. And then as you start to, as a result, measure the impact that you're hoping to create, it'll give you feedback as to whether that hypothesis that you have is actually correct or not. So it's really important as you move around this cycle and you will cycle through it depending on how often you measure things. But ideally, annually, you'll continue to refine and improve and adjust your theory of change and it will get closer and closer to the reality that you're seeing and you'll get more and more impactful. But if you think of it as a one-way street, um, you're losing all those insights and your, your ability to create positive change will diminish over time because you're not improving your practice and the world is changing. So that's why this work matters. So we think about it as, well, you know, government needs me to measure something or my, uh, you know, I'm interested in impact investing and I want to attract investors or I need to put it out there to the public so they know what I do. Um, but really, it's to maximise your impact. So that's the frame of why we do this in the first place and why it's really ad adding value to organisations who are choosing to uh, create social, environmental or cultural impact. Oh, there we go. So, these are just a tiny, tiny fragment of the tools and platforms that are out there for you to choose from. And it can get incredibly confusing. Uh, so there's a couple here that I would call out. So one would be the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. That one is probably getting the most traction because um, it basically allows us all to benchmark our outcomes and saying this is when we're doing this piece of work, this is what we're ultimately referring to. So mapping to um, the Sustainable Development Goals is probably a good idea. In the same way, things like IRIS and others are trying to give us a shared language, and so they may well be useful. A lot of people like the work of the Impact Management Project, so they're probably worth a look. Um, in one of the social impact bonds I'll talk about today, we use the Outcome Star, which is the bottom left-hand corner there, you'll see. Um, but what I'd say basically is, don't worry about any of these. Just ignore them, because they're not really helpful. You can come back to them later if you want to, um, but there's much more important work to be done. And I think we can get really overwhelmed by the number and the growing number of, of tools and frameworks and platforms that are out there. And it just feels too much. You don't know where to begin. So I would say you begin with the change that you're trying to create. You begin with the impact that's important to you. And these tools will sort themselves out later. So the first thing we need to understand if we're building from first principles is the difference between these things. So there's a lot of language again that's being thrown out there. But if you think about it, there's a line that runs across this pyramid. So there's, there's strategic activities, which is the actions that you take. Um, then there's the outputs, what you achieve from your actions. And then there's a line. And once you hit impact and outcomes, Imagine that you've crossed over from your organisation into the community, into the world, into the region, whatever it might be. And now you're starting to think about what happens outside your organisation that may be as a result of something that your organisation has contributed to, but it's happening outside your organisation and something is changing for the beneficiaries 
that you were set up to serve. So an impact and an outcome is essentially what changes in someone else's life. So we often get caught up in what changes in our own organisational life and all the things that we're doing and what happens as a result, but you've got to go across that line and get into the lives of your beneficiaries and understand what's happening in their lives, how things are improving for better or for worse, and also understand the systems that influence them. So you might be trying to achieve a certain outcome, but because a system that, that um, your beneficiaries are sitting inside, maybe it's impossible. And so you need to start working on that system as well. Or maybe that system is taking them in a different direction, or maybe that system is pushing them to exhibit certain behaviours that you can't understand. Um, so without an understanding of both what's happening in the lives of your beneficiaries and the systems which they interact with, which could be a system that relates to housing or welfare or education or um, job seeking or um, healthcare systems, things like that. So without understanding their interactions with the system and how that influences their lives, you might not be as impactful as you want. So the outcomes you can think of as something that happens in the lives of people um, that you're working with and the impact is the sort of longer term and more systemic view of how things are changing for them. So if you've got that bit right, this is absolutely critical. Until this is super clear, I wouldn't proceed um, with doing an impact measurement framework. But once this is clear, then you can proceed to the next level. And this is, you know, I said there's a line across that pyramid. Under that line is what's called impact management. So that's the things that you do inside your organisation to create the change you're looking to see um, with your beneficiary group or in society more broadly. And we get these two things confused. So we might be measuring activities and things we're doing to better understand whether we're creating the impact we intend by doing the actions we've committed to. So that's impact management. It's an internal uh, window. And so that's really important, but that's not impact measurement. And it's something that your, your executive team and your board should be deeply interested in, but no one else. And so that's not the kind of stuff that you share in the public domain, but you do track it, like you track normal organisational measures. Impact measurement on the right-hand side is what sits above the line outside your organisation, and it's your ability to demonstrate the change that you're seeking to create in the world for your target um, beneficiary cohort or for a system that you might be trying to adjust for their benefit. So again, it's inside and outside. So activities and outputs are inside, and that's about impact management. Outcomes and impact are outside your organisation, and that's about impact measurement. So I think, Camille, you're probably keeping an eye on questions, so please feel free, if you've got any questions, just to type them in, and we'll get to them. And if Camille thinks that they're crushingly urgent, I'll stop. Yes, um, for sure. But otherwise, uh, we'll keep going. Uh, but this is... there, there's not any burning question right now, so yeah, please. Go. Okay. But this, again, this differentiation of understanding between these two things is critically important. So when you're talking about impact measurement, you're talking about measuring what happens outside your organisation with your beneficiary group. So what's the process? Where do I begin? So you're going to begin essentially with your theory of change, with your hypothesis. hypothesis. So what are the strategic activities that we undertake in order to create the change we want? And think about it like baking bread. So what's the recipe is essentially your theory of change. And some people do what's called a program logic, which is a very detailed theory of change. It has all the activities in huge amounts of details, indicators, measurements, outputs, outcomes, and so on and so on. I don't think you need to go into that much detail so I did a lot of work when I was living in South Africa with the Germans. And I don't know if there are any German colleagues on the call, but let me be slightly insulting, is that they over-engineered the logical framework um, work we were doing for the, uh, you know, the grant funding that they were putting in place to within an inch of our lives. And I remember sitting in a, a small um, meeting room in, uh, in Germany one year on a project we were doing in Southern Africa. And we were debating for a good half a day the meaning of a couple of English words. And I was ready to slip my wrist. It was excruciating. 
And so I think it's probably by the trauma caused by that experience, I would say back it up a little bit from some of the, the program logic that you see. It's not a bad discipline, but don't feel like you have to be slavishly attached to it. So you just have to understand what are the strategic activities that you will take to get the outcomes that you want. And then from there, you develop your theory of change. And I've got a few examples to show you later of what some good theory of change just will look like. So we'll get into that. But once you've developed that hypothesis, if we do this, then these things will happen. You might say in the short, medium and long term, you could step it out like that. But basically, if we do this, then these things will happen. And sometimes if you're a funding organisation or if you're an influencing organisation, you might say, if we do this so that the organisations we fund or the organisations we seek to influence do this, then these things will happen. So there might be another layer into your theory of change, depending on what kind of organisation you are. Um, so your impact management framework monitors those internal activities that are taken by you and are looking to regularity and quality and coordination and things like that. So that's something that your CEO and your, um, your program leads would keep right on top of. But once you've got that theory of change in place, it's from this that you actually build your measurement framework. So to jump straight into a measurement framework without a theory of change, um, their monsters lie. You're going to get a really poor result if you go that way. And this is why I say it's not worth um, getting into all the, the tools and the, the, the systems that you could use and the frameworks and so on, because they're not going to tell you how you create the change that you're seeking to, to have in the world. And you need to do that fundamental work first before later you can think about what tools might be useful for you. Because whilst we might all be heading towards similar kinds of goals, be it um, you know, increased well-being, be it improved educational outcomes, reductions in reoffending behaviours, improved mental health, um, uh, job-seeking behaviours, and a whole range of things, uh, housing and so on, we might be going about it in different ways. And so it's really important to understand, given the strengths of your organisation and the network in which your organisation sits, what are the things that you bring to bear to create the change that you're hoping to see in the world? And it may be that it doesn't work. It may be that when you start measuring impact, there's none and it's not what you thought. And so you might go back and adjust your theory of change and in fact adjust your organisational structure or the activities and programs that you undertake and things like that. And then retest again and see if this actually has an impact. And so just using a tool to collect a lot of data and spit out reports doesn't help you do anything. So you only do that once you've done this work, then you've got a framework in which that information sits. So you might take a few goes at getting that theory of change right, at really trying to understand how the strengths of your organisation play into something that's really impactful. But without having a hypothesis about how you create change, trying to measure that change, trying to measure that impact, is a waste of time. So you have to begin at the beginning, like all good things, and then move forward. Cindy, please allow me to jump in. There is one question while we are still talking about theory of change. Yes. So someone from the audience asks, um, so with um, theory of change hypothesis, do we use yeah. the SDGs um, to validate the belief that the change is valued? Is that a good way to use those? No, I wouldn't worry about them until later. So once you've got a measurement framework, that's when I think you start mapping up to an SDG. So you should know inside your organisation, um, and even if you're creating something from scratch, you should have a sense of where you'd like to head. But just do that work on your own first, and then when you start to um, think about the outcome, um, rather than how you create the outcome, when you think about the outcome, then map it up to SDGs. But thinking about how you uniquely do it or how you do it in the same way as someone else based on a proven model that's been tried and tested elsewhere and you're trying to apply it in your context, thinking about how you do it is much more important in that early stage than trying to map it to anything else. So that can also be a distraction. So just wait, that will happen. But focus, focus first and be very clear as to how you create that change. Now, 
a lot of strategy workshops that we were all going to, you know, 10, 20 years ago, we'd all sit in a room and we'd say, okay, what do you think about this? And there'd be, you know, members of staff and a few other people and so on. And we'd all kind of contribute our experience and we'd say, yep, that's how we're going to um, drive our strategy going forward. Now, what we're seeing these days is a slightly different approach to strategy development because we're using evidence-based design much more. So we went through a period as well where we were talking about human-centered design and so we were consulting end users and so on. And in, in, or, you know, in our context for purpose-driven organizations, that may well be the beneficiaries of the services we deliver. Um, but another layer has been added in in the last five years or so as we're starting to get to grips with evidence-based design. And we're starting to say, what does the evidence tell us about this work? So if I'm trying to reduce homelessness in Brisbane, for example, what do I know about reducing homelessness? What, what research has been undertaken? What programs have been evaluated and shown to be successful? What partnerships are important and so on? So I would begin perhaps before I develop my theory of change even to think about um, doing some reading and really understanding uh, what's been done by other people now, I've sat on so many um, selection panels where people are either pitching by writing an application or they're pitching by um, making a, you know, a presentation in front of you. And they'll tell me, you know, I'm incredibly passionate about X, Y, Z problem. And, um, you know, this is the first time we've seen anyone in Australia or in the world do it like this. And because I've seen so many of those pictures, I would go, mm, oh, I could think probably half a dozen off the top of my head, people have done it just like that. So one of the things I think that um, doing some reading before you start building your theory of change does for you is just to check if anyone else has done it. So you're not making these false claims, which make you look silly in front of people that you're trying to influence. So spend a little bit of time and find out who else has done it, what have they learned, and how can you build off that is a really worthwhile um, use of your time. So you do that, you build your theory of change, and then you're thinking, yes, now, um, how can I think about measuring it? Because I'm comfortable with what I've got in terms of my theory of change. And at that point, you'd say, okay, these are the outcomes that we think we can reasonably create. Um, and let's now look to map them to the SDGs. And don't do it slavishly, but just it gives people a point of reference um, that they can anchor to if they're not kind of sure what it is um, that you're doing in detail. All right, the next point I have for us is a really important one, is who is your audience? So let's assume now that you've, you've identified your theory of change, you've got your measurement framework in place, and there's still a lot of work I haven't talked about so much as yet, but we'll get to that. But before you build your impact measurement framework with any, um, any rigor, I suppose, or enthusiasm, always start with knowing your audience. Because people will tell you stories, let me put it that way. They will tell you that the level of detail that people want is up here. It's enormous and they need all this rigor and so on and so on. And so your measurement frameworks need to be incredibly complex and incredibly thorough and so on and so on. And whether you're, you're reporting to government or the woman in the top, top right hand corner there, she's my impact investor. Um, and then we've got Bill Gates as representing our uh, philanthropic um, partners. Now, I did look for an Australian philanthropist. And when I Googled images around Australian philanthropists, Twiggy was the only one that came up, uh, which was really interesting, I thought. There are a hell of a lot more, but Google didn't recognise any of them. And the, the bottom left there is the general public. So these are all four important audiences that... Um, organizations, whether they're not for profit or for profit, are now playing to if they're for purpose. And we have to think about what each audience might want. Now, government has historically um, looked at activity reporting and paying at best for outputs. They're starting to move to paying by outcome. So we're seeing social impact bonds. I think there's about 14 or so um, out at the moment. And there's a number of new ones that are in development at the moment. Um, we see payment by outcomes or payment by result contracting, and there's more of those. And they don't, they're not always in the public domain, so I don't know the number, but there are more of those. And there's just your normal, um, you know, your normal contracting that you would have from government service delivery contracting. And so they want acquittal. They want a lot of information. 
but they are starting to move from activities and outputs to outcomes, which I think is a great thing. They're not necessarily letting go of the activities and the outputs. They're just requiring more outcomes on top. But hopefully, as they start to build confidence in the ability of outcomes to capture everything that goes before, we'll see less of the report on everything and more just reporting on the outcomes. Um, but they certainly do want a level of detail um, in, in acquitting the contracts that they give to you. Now, your impact investor, your top right there, she uh, or her agents will tell you that she needs a lot of information. Now, my experience of impact investing in the last decade or so is that's not true. So they need to see, what they really like to see is that you've thought about it. So having a theory of change and a measurement framework is really what they're looking for. They want to know you've given it some thought. They want to know that you've done some reading. So you might put in a page or so about the evidence base that you've drawn on to, to come to these conclusions. Um, they would find that useful. Um, but once they've jumped over that hurdle and they have a level of comfort that you're clear, you have real clarity about what it is your organisation is designed to do in the world, the impact it's designed to create, they don't actually need a lot of detail in terms of how you report to them and, and a fraction of probably what you think they do. So there's the initial hurdle of logic and rigour and clarity and then it's just simple things out the other end is fine by them. What they do want to understand, depending on what kind of investment it is, is risk. And if there is a risk attached to their financial return um, that's based on your ability to create impact or social return, then they will crawl through those risks as they relate to how you're generating the impact. So that's the case in a social impact bond, for example, or a payment by outcome contract if they're investing in it. Um, but if, if it's not that, if they're just investing in your social enterprise, for example, I, I swear to you, they'll be more interested in your financial and your business management than they will about your impact management. They'll be really happy with a basic set of measures that let them know on a regular basis, which is six months to a year, as to how you're tracking on those things of, you know, reducing homelessness or improving ed educational attainment or whatever it might be. They'll be happy with that. So you don't need to over-engineer your measurement framework. You just have to show that you know what you're doing in creating that impact and that's fine for them. You absolutely need to show that you know how to run your business that they will care much more about as that impact investment goes forward. Then let's talk about Bill. So Bill and all the other uh, philanthropic organisations in Australia and overseas um, will care very much about your logic similarly. So more and more you're seeing um, the requirement of philanthropic grant making saying, we, we want to see what your theory of change is. Do you have an evidence base? Have you read the literature about your area of impact? And do you know what it says? Have you built a measurement framework or do you at least intend to and could we support you to do that? So more and more, including the uh, foundation that I sit on, Hand Heart Pocket, of whom a number of my colleagues are on the call today. So hello to the gang. Um, it's something that we absolutely require of grantees, but we also are willing to support them as they go through that process. So it's not that it has to be tied up with a bow for every philanthropic foundation, but there certainly has to be some movement along that path and a willingness to build those skills to get more rigor um, and more logic in terms of what we're saying about our impact creation and impact measurement. So there's a requirement for it, but we're seeing more and more that both corporate philanthropy and high net worth and family um, philanthropic organisations are willing to help you build that capability and will go some way towards doing that. So we're working with a large corporate client at the moment and they invest millions of dollars a year in the community. And we've done this whole piece of work that I'm describing to you now. We've done that for them in their impact area of choice and that will then be available to their community partners to lift and use Holus Bolus. So, you know, you can um, customise it to your own particular organisation, but basically they've done all the hard yards for you so that you can pick it up and run with it and make it work for you and then equip back to that in a fairly uniform fashion. So we're seeing more of that going forward, um, which is great. So you might need um, a bit more rigour in terms of your your measurement than say your impact investor, but not a lot more. 
as long as you're demonstrating your ability to move towards those outcomes that matter, um, then that's sufficient. And I think the philanthropic organisations are going along with the organisations they fund on this journey of getting better at this and understanding how we all work in this together. So I think that's a quite a collaborative approach. And then we've got the general public. Now the ACNC gave us a bit of a bum steer a little while ago saying that you can tell them how good an organisation is by how much money it spends on um, its, its internal operations. And for me, that's a red herring. Um, I think you can tell how good an organisation is based on the impact it creates. And we had a client um, who we worked with for about three years. And when we started working with them, they were a not-for-profit and they were doing, um, they were a charity that uh, was a medical charity and they were running, you know, annual events and things like that that would help them raise money. And then they would take that money and they would invest it in research against the medical issue they were trying to get some headway on. And then we started working with them on really what their organisational strengths were and how their impact was created so they could build an impact strategy. And what became very clear is they could do more by influencing for the change that they wanted. They could push money into research more effectively by influencing than they could by running fundraising events. So they changed their model to understand, and it was who they were already, they just didn't see it that their primary capability to creating change was about influencing others, um, policy makers, um, families who are affected by this to work together as advocates um, towards government, uh, working with other partners around the world, working with um, pharmaceutical agencies and so on and so on. And also, even as it turned out, creating collaboration platforms which would fast track research. So they've gone from being your classic fundraising organisation to a very strong influencing organisation that is probably pushing 10 to 20 times as much money into the research of this area as they were before. So their impact has gone through the roof. But when you look at their, um, their finances on the ACNC reporting, it seems like they spend a lot of the money they make internally. So their ratios, if that's how you were judging them, would be off. And that's because they're employing really senior, really talented people to do this influencing work. And they're not putting a lot of money into programs because that's not where they add value. And so their numbers look different to what we're used to. And so the question is, what impact do they create? And so when you look at their impact, they're incredible. And they've really had some breakthrough moments and they have been leading the way globally on, um, on that particular area of medical research. So phenomenal stuff. So the general public needs to be helped towards moving away from that, you know, um, how much do they spend on themselves? And even you can see with the whole debate that's been in the papers about the Red Cross with the bushfires and things like that, it's not really understanding how impact is created. So we need to help educate the public towards what, um, being able to tell how good an organisation is by the impact it creates. Now, a lot of organisations have been putting impact reports out there um, and there's lots of examples of that and that's a forward step. But when you actually read those impact reports, they're still activities and outputs. They're really not outcomes. They're talking about what the organisation has done and things like that. And that's a place to start, but I think we can do better. And I think we can start talking about how our organisation's actions are creating change for the beneficiaries. I remember reading one really well known, really well thought of kind of young, punchy, um, not for profit that was making waves all over the world. And I was reading their impact report. And I remember it was a slide deck. And I remember getting to slide number 23 before they mentioned a beneficiary. And I'm a little sensitive to it. I'm usually looking for it. So maybe I'm the only one that noticed, but I noticed slide 23 that's a lot of slides talking about other things before you get to the beneficiaries and the whole thing about impact measurement is we do this for the people we serve so we need to front them we need to put them right up the front of our impact reports and talk about what's changed in their lives and then the back end of that is how we've contributed to that and there's a big debate in impact measurement about attribution versus contribution and can we attribute a change solely to our organization and I would say never, so don't try. It really doesn't matter. And sometimes funders ask you to do that, particularly government and so on. 
well, what about the attribution? Life's complex. And all we can say is that we've contributed towards it. And we need to be able to demonstrate that contribution is material. Um, but there will be many other organisations and many other circumstances and systems and, and situations that are influencing that change. But we have to demonstrate our contribution to that. Um, but we certainly want to be talking about our beneficiaries long before we're talking about ourselves. And the other audience that I've left off here, just checking the time, is um, yourselves. And so as I said earlier, for me in many ways, the primary audience for your impact measurement reports is yourself. Because your job is to get better and better at creating those, uh, those outcomes. And if you're able to learn each cycle, so let's call it each year, that you're doing the impact measurement, then you should be getting better and better. So you should be in fact the primary audience um, and be able to use that information internally. So here are some examples of measurement frameworks. Now, when we first really got stuck into measurement, this was six, seven years ago, working on the Benevolent Society's Resilient Family Social Impact Bond. And we had four measures and a whole lot of evaluation pieces and so on, it was quite complex. Here are some of them. So as you can see, if you're looking, say in that first column, um, the parent caregiver reports. So we're seeing the, the difficulty scores dropping over time. And so people, parents were feeling more positive about their ability to, to, um, to work with their children and parent their children and so on. So they were less likely to go into out of home care, which is what this bond was about. Um, and the Neville Society was working with 300 families. Um, I think it was about 700 children seven, eight hundred, any rate, a lot of children, because there was more than one child per family. Um, we were also seeing the, um, the trauma, their perception or their experience of trauma was going down. And see the green dotted line? That's the, the norm. So that's sort of the average population. So in each instance, we're seeing that the, the work that the Benevolent Society was doing with, through resilient families was not only bringing these families and these individual children and, and caregivers and so on, um, to normal population rates, but even better than normal population rates, which is pretty impressive. And you can see the third column there on the right is the, um, the wellbeing index, the personal wellbeing index. And it went to above the norm. So people on the program had a better sense of wellbeing. So these are brilliant. And we did huge amounts of work to measure this. We had um, a propensity matched control group for every family that came onto the program. There was a propensity matched family that went into the control group and da, 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 da. So we did that. This bond closed in October last year and it was very successful. Um, and it made a, a significant improvement to the lives of families who were at risk of go, having their children taken away and going into out of home care. Um, but I tell you what, we'd never do it like this again. So what we did was uh, three, Three and a half years ago, we negotiated another bond. And this was with um, the Queensland government. And this is the Youth Connect social impact bond that supports young people to make them more resilient. So they're not at risk of homelessness when they leave care at the other end. And this one we designed much more simply. Um, so you don't need a PhD in sociology to understand it or to apply it. Basically, we said there's a hurdle. So because it's a homelessness bond, we said we had to demonstrate that a young person was continuously housed for six months. So it might not be in the same place because we all move at some point and that might happen in that six months, but they're not homeless in between. So continuous housing stability for six months plus one of these other three. So either educational stability, um, so TAFE, school, something like that, or employment stability, which could be part-time because they may be also studying at TAFE or something like that, or their mental health might mean that they can't work full time, it's just not possible, that's fine, part-time employment is fine, or something that's called personal development, which included parenting classes for new parents, um, because 27% of young people who leave care are already parents, which is shocking, uh, particularly because they can leave as young as 16. Uh, it could also include help-seeking behaviour when you have a mental health crisis, that might lead you to being in treatment. 
And that was considered personal de development because it was a good step forward to see young people asking for help and going and getting it and receiving the help that they were offered. So that was considered personal development and job seeking is also considered personal development. So as long as they're doing any one of these things, or so any combination of these things, then they are perceived by the state and agreed by the state to be um, demonstrating increased resilience. So we went from, with the first bond we ever did, to super, super complicated, to these days we're seeing bonds which are simpler. And we always thought that the bonds were the most complicated impact measurement and, you know, the control groups and blah, 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 and what's your counterfactual and all this kind of language. You know what? You can get them up much more simply than that. And we're seeing that around the world as well. These kind of, you know, baseline models and distance travelled models and things like that, which are far, far simpler. And it's simpler for investors to understand. It's less onerous on the people involved, the beneficiaries. It's easier to have the discussions and to prove it between you and the state and all of those things. So you can get up even what are considered these most complex uh, instruments with simple measures. Um, so there's a full description of this on our website if you wanted to read up more about that bond and how we've done a strength-based approach because most of the other bonds have designed from a kind of a weakness, less offending, you know, less drug and alcohol use and that kind of thing, but we really wanted to do a strength-based approach. So there's more info on the, on the website about that. Um, then when you're thinking about social enterprises, so for me, Vanguard is one of the, the gold standard measurement um, examples. They've got a really nice theory of change, and this is just one part of their measurement framework. And you can see there's a number of different domains they're measuring. There's a few like this. So all in all, Vanguard Laundry in Toowoomba measures 74 different data points. And they have a PhD um, uh, student that does all of that. And then there's a team of people that pull all that together and do all the analysis. They pull in um, government data that's hard to get. And they do all this amazing work and they issue this beautiful annual report. This is gold standard. I love it but it's expensive and time consuming and I don't think we all have to match this standard. So if you want to look, if you want to know what really, really good looks like, it's this. But again, we don't have to go to these levels to know if we are creating outcomes. You could take a lot fewer measures, a bit like we did with the social impact bond. You could just measure a handful of things and every one of those audiences that I gave you before would be happy with that. It doesn't have to be this complicated. Having said this, the, the audience that most values the Vanguard reporting is uh, funders. It gives funders a lot of confidence. So you've got to strike a balance between what's onerous on you to manage and measure and report on, as opposed to what your, uh, your funders really need to know. So I wanted to show you, I keep flipping in the wrong direction. I wanted to show you um, a theory of change and measurement framework that, that um, we love at social outcomes and we often show people it's just super simple but it's also profound and important and we we came across these guys when we were doing a piece of work last year for uh, arts queensland and they wanted to do a 10-year roadmap of the future of the arts and how arts organizations could be sustainable so we thought if arts organizations were more cognizant of the contribution they make to social outcomes that the state and other funders are willing to purchase, then it may be that arts organisations would be more sustainable. So that was our theory of change, if you will. And we found this beautiful um, organisation called Streetwise. They're actually funded by the Macquarie Foundation and the Macquarie Foundation didn't know about that <laughs> because they were funded out of the London office. Um, but they're a fantastic organisation that works with street people, a bit like the Choir of Hard Knocks, but more comprehensive and they have uh, support structures wrapped all the way through what it is they do, but they use opera. And I'm not a massive opera fan, to be honest, but I tell you what, it certainly is working. And when you read their full report uh, and Google it, it's online, you can read their, um, their impact report. For me, they kind of buried the lead because at the end they were talking about the magnificent reduction in homelessness they've had as a result of this. So they've done all these things that you can see in the middle, all those sort of short to medium term outcomes of you know, improving um, a sense of belonging and enjoyment and confidence and all those good things. But they've led on to the impact at the bottom, those sort of longer term things. And the numbers they're cracking are enormous. I think it was like 
from memory, 93% of the people in the program were housed and were in stable housing. It was ridiculous. So they've had some really, really good outcomes, but they have this sort of beautiful, simple, elegant framework that they work to. And so what I might do is just leave the input there and um, make sure I've left 15 minutes for questions and happy to answer anything you'd like to know about any of these examples, but also more sort of broader principles. Thank you, Sandy. I, I agree. It's just a beautiful visual. Uh, there's nothing like a beautiful picture to tell a story. Um, anyone has a question from the audience? I know we have a couple of entrepreneurs, so please feel free to jump in and mute yourself and ask Sandy directly. Um, otherwise, I will just go through some questions that have been typed early, um, early on. So there was, um, I might go with a question from the audience. There was some question about how to train yourself or how to learn about um, developing an outcome measurement um, framework um, here in Australia. Are there some courses that um, obviously we can um, ask experts like yourself yeah. and get help from consultants, but what, what do you recommend reading or, or learning um, to become better at um, outcome measurement? Um, so we've got it on our website, we've got a toolkit page. And so I think there's about 10 different topics there and we've put readings and resources and projects and things like that onto the website so people can have uh, you know, a quick overview. So that's one uh, option to keep it simple. But there are organisations like the Centre for Social Impact has um, uh, an outcomes measurement course coming up soon. Um, Gary, Karen, when is that on? Is it next week? I'll have I to unmute. I think it was about September in Canberra. Was, was it next one? that far away? I thought it was an online one. Oh, okay, an online one. Oh, okay. I thought it was. But anyway, the Centre for Social Impact, um, they do run a two-day workshop on it. So, and the Centre for Social Impact are the organisation that did the Vanguard Laundries Impact Report. So they're super good, but keeping in mind that they're academic. And so with that academia comes a level of rigour that might not be, or it might be overkill for a small social enterprise. So you've just got to right size it. And the way that we think about impact measurement is it has to help you be ready for a transaction. So whether that's um, an impact investment or a contract or a, a funding you know, allocation by a philanthropic, but it's got to lead towards something pragmatic and helpful to you. And so we need to ground it in the day to day practicalities. What's, what's just enough to get you to where you want to be with whatever that transaction is, but not too much so that it, it drives you into the ground and all you're doing is impact measurement. Um, so it's about finding that balance. So I don't see a lot of courses out there that would be thinking about transactions, but certainly CSI are um, top shelf in terms of um, their understanding of social issues like this. Okay, thank you, Sandy. And I guess it comes back to the impact you are creating, which yes. each entrepreneur is a, an expert in. So yes. at the end of the day, the metrics will come back to what are you trying to um, create in terms of impact and you are, you should be the, in, the expert of this. So it's very empowering yes. actually to see through your presentation, how some um, organization use their own data. You know, we will always think of reporting like something complex that we need to be doing externally, but you're showing that um, serving your own customers against a, um, a sample group is, is a really good start. Yeah, it's perfectly fine. It's perfectly yeah. fine. Because you've got to constantly ask yourself, what am I going to do with the information I collect? And if the answer is not much, then don't collect it because yeah, it's exactly. a pain for everybody. Mm. Just collect what you absolutely need, the bare minimum of what you need to know to ensure that you're creating the impact you want and to get better at it and to mm. communicate with your key stakeholders. But bare minimum. And even ask people. Ask, you know, your, your uh, foundations that are supporting you. Ask government. So ask people. What's the bare minimum that you need to know? Because we don't want to overinvest in measurement that's just going to waste time mm. and money. We really want to be efficient and effective, but what, what's the bare minimum that yeah. you need? And it's to support um, 
decision making, right? Absolutely. Um, we, we have another question, great question from um, the audience. Could you briefly tell us a little bit more um, about the strength based approach versus um, the weak um, versus focusing on weak points? Yes. Um, I wonder if I've got an example in Vanguard. So Vanguard, one of the things Vanguard did is they, it's on another grab, but they talked about the reduction in um, medication use, which is a good news story, but it's, you know, people were on um, antidepressants and things like that. And so that's been reduced. Um, smoking, they also measure and that's been reduced. And so those are all great stories, but if you're asking people things, it's a little bit like appreciative inquiry. If you ask people negative things, it create it has like a halo effect. So if you're asking young people about the last time that they had contact with the police or the courts, you're kind of saying, I'm just assuming you have. And so there's something about it that um, fronts up to them their train wreck of a life that they have to talk about with someone from yet another institution and so on. And so it becomes the dialogue that's probably in their heads as well as what they're having to spend time talking about. So when we're constantly looking for, given that they're improvements, but negative things where, you know, we're thinking about when was the last time you were uh, sectioned with the mental health breakdown and so on. It's, these are difficult things to talk about. Whereas if we're asking them about how they're growing their resilience and their independence and their ability to make choices for themselves and what they're learning. It's a very different conversation. So with the Youth Connect Bond, we use as the impact management tool, we use the Outcome Star. Now the Outcome Star is a tool that I would recommend having worked with it in a couple of different organisations because it does just that. And it, it basically is a conversation between a caseworker you know, or an equivalent caseworker and in this instance, a young person saying, talk to me about um, your, you know, your sense of comfort around areas of financial management or living with other people or uh, about your educational um, you know, life and things like that. So what the outcome star is every six months, you have that conversation and the young person in the caseworker sees how usually their, their competence and their confidence is growing in each point of the star and they do different stars for different circumstances. So we're looking at a youth homelessness star for that particular bond because it's about youth homelessness. Um, but the conversations we have are positive about how they're growing their resilience and we're asking them, have you been able to, um, to be stably housed? Have you been able to be stable at work? Have you been able to pursue personal development? Have you been able to keep going to school regularly? And their ability to say, yes, I've done these things and these things matter. And that's what we talk about. And we don't talk about their failures. We talk about their successes. It just reframes the conversation. It reframes the headspace. It reframes that sense of achievement that your beneficiaries will have when they're talking with you. Because often the research that we do on vulnerable groups is all about what's going wrong. Um, and it must be pretty soul destroying. So imagine if we talked about what's going right and we look forward to more going right in future. And that's the framing around, you know, what we've done. And we've had a lot of feedback from other um, practitioners, other um, not-for-profits about this saying they're so delighted to see that we took a strength-based approach because they are a little bit over all the, um, you know, finding fault with vulnerable groups that they're perfectly aware of how tough their lives are. They don't need to be reminded when they do all these interviews and surveys and so on. So I think there's something in that for us. How can we find the measures we're looking for, but take a strength-based approach because we understand that people have to engage with us and we leave a footprint where we go with this impact measurement. So the footprint needs to be light for their benefit, but it also needs to be capacity building for their benefit as well. And this can also take a, a similar approach with staff. When you're asking staff for information, when you're doing your impact management and you're collecting things, in the same way, if you're going to take data, you want to give data back. And so you can set up in your spreadsheets or whatever you like, if you're collecting data from them, give them some ability in the, in the spreadsheet to analyze the data that they've just put in against a previous month 
or against the rest of the, the, the cohort or whatever it might be, so that they're learning something about how they're tracking um, based on the data that's being collected more broadly. So it's a really good principle to have that if you're taking data, you've got to give data back. And that can be equally true for beneficiaries, actually. Um, but certainly when you're asking more of your team to input data, which is dull, to be honest, but if, if it's a moment in the week where you're importing data and you're learning about how things are tracking, what's been happening, are you moving forward, then it can be exciting to see what the numbers spit back out at you. Thank you, Sandy. There's um, a lot of enthusiasm in the chat um, right now. Uh, you'll have a look after this, I'm sure. Um, I have another question from Linus. So, um, who's asking, using Streetwise Opera um, talk example, would you prepare 19 separate impact and outcome measures? So, one for each main outcome and impact. Um, and how, how do you identify sustainable proxy measures? So I love a good proxy. <laughs> yeah. And I also love um, a lead indicator because outcomes and impact takes time. Three, four years, things like that. And our contracts are often two, three years long and so on. So sometimes you've got to use lead indicators, but you've got to be confident that it's on that journey. And this is why a theory of change is important. Because if we do a couple of um, rounds of that measurement cycle and we find that this indicator is consistent, uh, lead indicator is consistent with that future outcome, we can use the lead indicator. So I might not do all of those because, you, again, you've got to be aware of, um, of how much you're asking of people. I would see if I could cluster them or I could observe them. So increased creative skills, for example, I could find a way to observe that in their participation in opera activities rather than asking them. Um, so if there are ways that you can collect that data um, with proof points rather than with a survey, I, I prefer that, generally speaking. There are some things that you obviously have to survey. The downfall of surveys, if, if you're having a bad day, you're going to say no to every question. You know, if you didn't get enough sleep last night or you had a fight with your kids or your partner, you're just going to be cranky and that's what you capture. So surveys have an inherent weakness in them, but if you have evidence by their repeated behaviour of increased confidence, so, so I'd be thinking, how can I take the work from them to me and what things could I prove um, in their behaviours that I could observe that would demonstrate increased self-confidence? So that's why I also like proxies, is to say, what can we proxy? Um, so we've been doing, not surprisingly, quite a bit of work on impact measurement frameworks for resilience at the moment. And what does that look like? And an increased sense of belonging is a good proxy measure for growing resilience. So it's more complicated than that, but in a nutshell, that turns out to be quite a good proxy. So resilience in and of itself can be hard to measure. So if you're thinking about natural hazard disasters, for example, you might say, you know, is the community becoming more resilient with each disaster and how would you look, you know, at, at how that recovery is happening and the time frames and is the time extending? It's got to be in relationship to the size of the trauma and so on and so on. So it can be complicated. And having a nice proxy like that increased sense of belonging um, in a geographic community is a much neater and less traumatic way to get to that, um, that data, if you like. And if your funder can accept the evidence base that sits behind that being a proxy, um, so you can prove how that's worked in other situations, then that's a win-win for both you and for the community that you're, you're seeking to um, do some measurement on because that proxy neatens it up and it makes it easier and quicker and cheaper and less onerous on community members and so on, as well as the organisation. And if you can agree, that that proxy will work, which is what we did with the Youth Connect bond, is we agreed that those four things, any combination of those four things, would be the proxy for increased resilience in young people, which would reduce the risk of homelessness. So it's about a negotiation. So 17 feels like too many to me. Um, so I would try and get that down. What can you cluster? What can you proxy? What can you have as lead indicator? What can you observe rather than ask? 
and have a proof point that way. So that's kind of, that's the nuance and the flair, I suppose, of, of designing these frameworks is knowing how to do that. And that takes a bit of practice, but you know, we're seeing more and more organizations supporting you um, to get this done. And that's part of that support. Thank you, Sandy. Well-rounded answer. We can see that, um, you know, the ins and out of how to design the, the impact framework and all the nuances. Yes. Um, unfortunately, we've reached um, the end of the Q&A session. I'm um, conscious of your time um, today. So, um, like I said in the chat, if there are other questions, please um, email me and I will make sure that I pass on your um, feedback and questions to Sandy. Um, and if you need some professional help, well, now you know a fantastic expert that can help you with your impact measurement. Um, I will thank you again, Sandy. That was incredible. Um, such a wonderful content and lots of practical examples, which, which I like so much. There's been lots of um, lovely things said in the chat. So I'll definitely pass on the feedback. I'm going to have a look. Um, I will simply wrap up this, um, um, this webinar today by saying that, again, if you need to reach out to Sandy, um, the name of her company is Social Outcomes. Um, you can find it on Google or email me if you want to connect. Um, and we have other events coming up, so have a look. Um, on Tuesday, the 26th, uh, we will be talking about investing with impact during um, the COVID-19 crisis, quite a hot topic, um, with Amy Reid from First Unity Wealth Management. Um, on, the, on the Tuesday, June uh, the 2nd, um, we are fortunate enough to have the full imp, um, impact team. Uh, I, I think, Sandy, you know them well. Um, and we'll be talking about impact investing. Um, we'll be talking about global trends and Australian perspectives with Jemima Welsh, um, Lisa Segento, and Anthony Owen. So that will be a nice webinar as well. And finally, um, mid-June on the 16th, we'll be talking about um, something I'm really passionate about, which is natural capital. So how to connect finance with natural capital with um, Fiatra Kearney from Forever World. So lots of events coming up. Um, again, same time on Tuesday afternoon. Um, I hope to see you there. Um, and I think that's it for today. Sandy, do you want to say a final word or? No, just don't give up. It's not as hard as it looks. <laughs> that's a great way to end the session for today. Thank you again for your time today, Sandy. There's lots of thank yous in the chat and lots of claps. Uh, we're, missing you, <laughs> we're missing a We're missing. We're missing the engagement. Um, yeah. on, um, online, but um, yeah, there's lots of claps and lots of thank yous in the chat. So you made a great difference today, um, just by sharing your insights. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone, and um, I look forward to connecting with you um, during another webinar. Thanks. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.